say a little bit about the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a bit of a mouthful to say, but is a really important feature of the Earth's climate system. And so uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation is a phrase that refers to a cycle of climate changes that occur over sort of two to seven years on average. And it goes from the warm phase, which is called an El Nino, through an equivalent cold phase, which is a La Nina, and back over into a warm phase. And somewhere in the, in the middle, there's a neutral phase, which is neither one nor the other, but is more like the, the standard conditions of the Earth's climate. And so the centre of action of the El Nino Southern Oscillation is the Tropical Pacific. And so the Tropical Pacific is a huge ocean basin, right? It's a third of the, sort of a third of the Earth's circumference is included in the Tropical Pacific, which if you just look at a normal map, doesn't necessarily come across because it's always split in the middle because nobody lives there. But it is a really big feature. And because it's that big feature, it means that the climate system has a lot of space to sort of let its natural oscillations run free, I suppose. So the El Nino Southern Oscillation can play a really big role in the global temperature. And so what you see is a warming of maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees on a global mean sense. And so if you look at a if you look at a long time series of global mean temperature, it'll start off nice and low and get warmer and warmer and warmer, and it, but it'll bobble up and down. And, and the warm upticks of it are always going to be El Nino years. And so the warmest year on record, as I'm speaking now in, the, in early 2019, was 2016, which was a really strong El Nino year, probably the, biggest, the strongest El Nino we've ever had. Uh, and that was also the warmest year, and it's sort of the El Nino phenomenon bounces it above the, the background state on a global sense. But, as I said, this is really something that is predominantly occurring in the tropical Pacific. And so if you imagine your map of the world, then you spin the world around so you just see the tropical Pacific, then the then an El Nino year, you'll see really warm water, well, anomalously warm water, uh, off the coast, sort of spreading out from South America, uh, whilst in a La Nina year, that same region will be particularly cold. And, and when I refer to this as anomalies, that's mean with respect to the background state, because the background state isn't a, a big uniform temperature everywhere. So what you, let me just spend a little while describing what the background state of the Pacific is. And so this is a, there's, there's some feedbacks going on. So I'll just pick somewhere and I'm going to pick Indonesia, right? And so we're over in the West Pacific and this is where the warmest waters of the world are. And, and that's where the warmest waters of the world are. And so therefore that's also where the atmospheric convection occurs because and hot air rises, and so you get the, the hottest air, and the hottest air rises the most. And so from the surface of the ocean, you get this really warm air, and it lifts up to the top of the atmosphere, well, the tropopause, so about 10 kilometres up, and then it's going to spread. And most of that air actually spreads away from the equator, so heading out towards the, the mid-latitudes where it sinks, and as it sinks, it's going to stop there being any convection there. And so you end up with these big desert zones about 30 degrees north and south. But, the, but there's also a component that, that stays on the equator and it, and it goes up and then it heads from Indonesia over towards South America. And then it gradually sinks as it gets there and it sinks. And as it sinks, it cools. And so it cools, so it stops there being rainfall over there because it's sort of pushing down on all the air that's trying to push up. And then slowly there's a return flow in the atmosphere that, that heads back towards Indonesia. And it's that return flow that head back towards Indonesia that is going to act as a wind that's moving the, Earth's, the ocean surface along. So you've got this atmospheric flow due to the, due to the warm waters in Indonesia. And then there's cold, and the cold waters over in, uh, over in off South America, 
and that's this background flow. And then you get the, and then the ocean sees an atmospheric flow, sort of winds pushing the ocean, and those winds are pushing the ocean straight towards Indonesia. And right on the equator, there's, there's very little Coriolis force, and so you can imagine those winds just pushing it along. Where you move away from the equator, then actually the ocean water doesn't move in the same direction as the winds. There's the Coriolis force is due to the rotation of the Earth, and you actually get water moving at right angles to the way the wind's pushing. And so what that means is, is right on the equator, if there's a wind pushing along the equator, you'll actually get water moving away from the equator and bringing cold water up. And so you get this cold water being lifted to the surface and, and that, that forms an oceanic flow with, that sustains the warm water and cold water that, that sort of sustain the atmospheric flow. So you get these two coupled systems and they, and they feed back on each other to form the main background flow of the tropical Pacific, right? That's just the tropical Pacific in general. And then, and then an El Nino year is a weakening of that, ba that background state. An El Nino year is an even stronger uh, version of that background state. And, and because the sort of Indonesia is such a, an important part for where air is lifting up across the whole planet, you end up with changes in this circulation in the tropical Pacific having really global consequences. And so, say, in an El Nino year, you'll be having uh, drought uh, in Indonesia and floods in South America, but that'll spread out to Australia will be impacted. Uh, East Africa is going to be impacted in an El Nino year. The actual, the reason that the phenomenon has such a mouthful of a name of the El Nino Southern Oscillation is actually because it was the Southern Oscillation is an atmospheric phenomenon that was discovered by Gilbert Walker, who was a meteorologist in India, and he was trying to explain what was, cause, what was causing changes in the Indian monsoon, and he noticed this big change in the, in the circulation. And, and the El Nino part of the name comes from the oceanographers who completely separately were looking over in South America, not India, and, and discovered the sort of the warming uh, off the coast of the Americas that came uh, peaks in December, which is when uh, sort of around the time when Jesus was born. And so that's why it's called El Nino, is the story at least. And, it, and so there were these two completely separate phenomena, as they were thought. And it wasn't until sort of the 1960s when Bjorknes came along that really identified that these were, part, that these were two different parts of the same uh, climate phenomenon and a coupled atmosphere ocean feature and and sort of that realization came and people were interested in it as a academic topic uh, but it wasn't really until the 80s when there was a very strong El Nino in uh, 1982 and then another one in 1988 uh, that had really quite severe consequences. And the first one in 1982 had severe consequences and we, and we were worried about it. And, 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 but by the time the 1988 one came along, we'd actually put some instruments out in the tropical Pacific and we knew what the temperatures were doing and we could, we could rather than respond to it, follow it. And that led to the development of numerical models that were sort of, I suppose, initially a hybrid between a weather model and, a, and a, what I now think of as a climate model, uh, which could actually provide some sort of forecasting ability for these, uh, these phenomenon. And now that's something that we've moved into in a really operational sense, is this seasonal forecasting. Because the system is really sensitive and so dependent on each other, it really responds to very small no variations in the noise and it's most responsive in around in spring in sort of March April May time and so what that means is that we cut we can know what the El Nino is by doing our numerical forecasting but because it's so sensitive and we can't know what the the noise is 
what those individual storm systems in the region are going to do. It, it really prevents us to, from forecasting much beyond, say, nine months, uh, 12 months through that, forecasting through that spring predictability barrier. But, it, but we do have really pretty good operational forecasts now, and they're, they're, you should be thinking of them as probabilistic because it's on these long timescales. But still, we're able to provide enough of an early warning that maybe people will not be surprised and will be able to respond to it. But what we know about El Nino going into the future, so sort of that's on the that's on the month to month time scale, on the sort of the time scales of generations that climate change is occurring over, we know quite a bit less about it. We know we're confident that El Nino is going to still exist. We're confident it's still going to impact the globe and it's still going to be the most important mode of variability. But we don't know if it's going to get stronger, really. And we don't know if it's going to get weaker. You can do some particular measures and find out little bits that are robust. But it, it's something that we worry about because if it, it has such big consequences, if it changes, it could really impact what's going on. But it's, unfortunately, it's such a tricky and sensitive beast and you need, to get your, you need to get your model of the atmosphere just right. And you need to get your model of the ocean just right to get it. And then they need to talk to each other in the correct way as well, which itself isn't particularly easy. And so we get these, these senses of what might happen, but I don't think we really have a strong idea of what will happen to the El Nino Southern Oscillation in the future.